Um, all right, so hi everyone, I'm Lucy. I'm a junior at Belmont studying global leadership and um, German. And um, today is my interview. And um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Joshua McLeod and I'm the founder of Growability. Uh, our mission is to equip business and nonprofit leaders to enjoy meaningful work by creating scalable, effective, and generous organizations. I also have two nonprofit organizations, Instruments of Joy, where we provide quality musical instruments to musicians in need, and Picture the Nations, where we represent countries by the beauty of their people instead of the stigma of their poverty. We're kind of like National Geographic, but we give all the money to the people in the pictures. So that and nine kids, and I have a very uh, non-boring life. The nine children and all of the other endeavors. Yeah, my, my life mission is survive. No. <laughs> to survive, <laughs> to survive and thrive. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> okay, well, thank you again for joining me today. Um, I chose you because uh, the project is about leaders in the community and people who are successful and we look up to and um you always give good advice and are eloquently spoken so my first question for you um as this is a global leadership class is what leaders do you look up the, uh, up to the most and why um what leaders do i look up to the most i think the pers the single leader that i look up to the very most is my wife and it's funny because she wouldn't call herself a leader, um, but she exhibits, I think, one of the most important leadership characteristics that there is, which is kindness. Um, and I think of kindness sort of like Noah and the ark and like each of the animals two by two by their kind. And so somebody, a leader that exhibits kindness sees all people as the same kind. Like they, oh. they love on people the way they are and who they are and say kind of, in essence, you're the same kind as me. Um, so I really love leaders that exhibit kindness. Um, I'm also a super business nerd. So I love reading old dead people <laughs> that are really good at business like Peter Drucker and Deming and um, you know, if, if it, uh, if it's a book this thick that talks about boring stuff, I, I like it. that stuff. Yeah. So someone are business gurus and kind people. Those are the leaders that I look up to. Okay. I like those answers. Plus your wife has nine children. So how could she not be a leader? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Well, and she, you know, another thing that I think leaders do, I think ultimately leaders should all be trampolines where basically people kind of jump on you and you launch them as, as high as they can go. Um, so my wife's a good trampoline. <laughs> I like that. I like the image. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a lot of times people think that their job as leader is to like stand on the wall and reach right. down and pull you up to where you're at. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's okay leadership, but really great leadership is you're know, on the trampoline and just jump over the wall. Who cares? Right. <laughs> just, just jump right over that thing. So yeah. I like it. Okay, so my next question um, is about you individually um, with your success in your life. What skill of your own do you think has helped you the most? And kind of did you develop it? Were you born with it? Um, how exactly did that come about? Um, I think the number one skill that has served me well in life is curiosity because I love to learn. So I am naturally curious and I love to read books and I have uh, the strengths and weaknesses of a dyslexic mind where I don't look at things the same way that everybody else does. I look at them from like lots of different angles. And so there's a term called syntopical processing that talks about how certain people process information and I'm a syntopical processor which means it might take me a long time to answer a question, but I uh, enjoy uh, learning and, and simplifying complexity. Okay, that's a better way of saying it. Simplifying complexity is simplifying complexity. my wheelhouse. That I love to simplify, take things that are super complex and just say, what is the fundamental ingredient or habit or priority or whatever? And let's just focus on that. Yeah. That's a strength that has served me well in, in life and work. I think 
that could be very useful for people because it's hard to, you know, put it into different parts and then start where you're at. And people get so frustrated when they don't do that. And I struggle with that. I have like a hundred things to do. And then I'm like, shoot, I can't do any of them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's a, I'm I'm a fan of the strength finders tests and achiever is one of them that is just basically like you can solve world hunger today and then wake up in the next morning and be like, I didn't get anything done. Like yeah. you always have to get something accomplished. So right. I'm cursed with that wonderful strength. Yeah. <laughs> it is a strength, right. a struggle and a strength. <laughs> yeah. It's a struggle and a strength. <laughs> awesome. Um, so my next question is related to um, your consulting business. Uh-huh. Um, and like I said, as a college student, sometimes when people explain to me their jobs, I don't really know what they're talking about. <laughs> so um, can you kind of just explain what you do with your consulting business? Um, give an example, how that works and so so on. Yeah, well, I mean, so there's a statement that I've I've attached onto that says knowledge lies in the accumulation of facts, but wisdom lies in their simplification. So if I go and I get on Google and I do a search for how to set goals, I'm going to have like 60 different opinions of the best way to set goals or how to create a budget or how to build a marketing strategy or how to do all of these things. And so we live in a fundamentally knowledge rich society, but knowledge doesn't necessarily give you something practical that's actually going to help you. Right. Um, the simplification of knowledge is wisdom that where you take those options and then you choose what's the ideal option for a, a, a given scenario. So one of the things that, or I would say the primary role of a consultant is to ask the right question. And I want, I was really challenged when I started consulting and I was like, uh, this role is not for me because I cannot know everything and clients need, they have a zillion different needs. And I, you know, what if I'm working for a doctor and I didn't study medicine, how am I supposed to help the doctor? But, um, but what I learned is you can ask the right questions and that's what all good doctors do. They ask a good question and then they can diagnose. And so uh, I think one of the primary roles of a consultant is to ask the right question, understand all of the fundamentals of organizational management, leadership, management, marketing, and then be able to ask the right question uh, at the right time is a, is a critical role of consulting. Another thing is that, um, well, in, so in, in GrowAbility, in the company that, that I always started, we talk about the entrepreneurial lid. Yes, And so the lid is L-I-D. So the L is lack of knowledge, which every leader has the problem of, I don't know what I don't know. The I is isolation. Uh, I don't want anybody else to know that I don't know what I don't know. (laughs) And the D is discouragement. I know I don't know what I don't know. (laughs) And so um, my, my passion in life is to help entrepreneurs remove the lid. If you don't understand how to create a budget, let me teach you how to create a budget. You don't know how to make a marketing plan. Let me tell you how to make a marketing plan. And then let me get you together with other leaders so that you realize that everybody else is facing this same exact stuff that you're facing. And it's better. Life is better in community. Just get together with leaders like you and learn and grow together. I love too long. But that's my that's what I that's what my consultancy is about. No, it's helpful. The the lid um acrostic acronym i like it and it can be yeah. used for really anything besides in life because it's true when people feel isolated and they don't want to ask questions because they don't want to st- seem stupid but then they never learn so yeah if you bring knowledge to people or, and wisdom is like even better and you help to get people together and remove isolation and you give courage to people like no matter what you're doing if you're bringing knowledge and community encourage it's going to be successful even if it does not monetarily successful it's successful it's a beautiful act yeah i like it okay so uh, my next question is going to be about failure (laughs) um everybody's favorite topic so um we talk a lot in global leadership about uh, trials that leaders go through and how inevitably it ends up making them better leaders because they grow through it 
So um, can you give an example of a trial or failure that's helped you grow as a person and or professionally? Uh, yeah, let me give you a couple. Um, let me see like specific examples. Uh, well, okay. So I, my, my first failure was like my, my first job uh, climbing the corporate ladder. I was a, uh, I was just a put up or shut up like leader at my company and I hired a bunch of people and then I just continually talked about how they weren't as smart as me and they weren't as getting stuff done. And I was like, you have better degrees than me. You have this, like, why aren't you putting this out? Right. And I just realized that like uh, fear is a motivator, but love is a much better motivator. And my first whole career was like fear-based management, which was the biggest mistake ever. And so as like a 20 some year old idiot, <laughs> I was just like, well, I'm the boss. So I'm going to go do this stuff. And that was my first big mistake is to learn that uh, fear sucks as a leadership modality. Um, had some success in the litigation technology consultant. That's what I did my first career. And then I spent seven years in 21 countries stu studying global poverty. Mm -hmm. And on my first trip overseas, I went to Ethiopia and I thoughtlessly just raised my camera and took a picture of this lady without asking permission because she just looks super fascinating. And she was like an impoverished lady. And she started screaming at me. And I was just like, yeah, you should be screaming to me. Like, what am I thinking? Like, I was just, I was thinking about my camera and the f-stop and the new lens that I had and how this picture was going to look great. But what she was saying, my translator told me that what she was saying is, "Don't take my picture if you can't fix fix my poverty." Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the biggest mistakes that any leader can make is trying to be excellent without taking into account the human cost of whatever it is that you're doing. Right. Um, and so that mistake was beautiful because then I never took a picture again without asking permission yeah. and even bringing printers along and printing out pictures and giving them to people and do all of those things. Um, I mean, you know, there's in there's statistics that like eight out of 10 small businesses fail or, you know, it's more like 60 percent or whatever. But then there's statistics that like eight eight out of 10 second businesses succeed. Uh -huh. The The best education that you can get is failure. Right. So like, if you fail at a business, great. Like I, I started a marketing company right off that like totally failed. <laughs> and so now I'm a business consultant. And so you're like, well, you no. had to fail business right. and now you're a business consultant. I'm like, yes, I had to fail business and now I'm a business Now consultant. you know how to help people. Yeah, well, you just know you know what can carry the weight of a thing if right. you don't have integrity in a thing and you step on it it will break but if it's if it's, if i stand on a rock it's great if i yeah. stand on a piece of paper it might not hold weight yeah so failure allows you to know what can you stand on that's good I like that. what looks like you can stand on it you know right. failure is really good at helping you know this is something i could stand on yeah wow um so you talked a little bit about studying poverty and um, that's not a small thing. So I want to talk a little bit about that because mm -hmm. in our global leadership, we talk a lot about poverty and um, nonprofits and just everything within that realm. Mm -hmm. And um, for most people like living in America or in developing a developed country, um, it's hard to know how to help. You see like all these problems, you, you see it on the internet, you get frustrated so then you just stop thinking about it and without taking any action. So for people who maybe aren't going to go travel to these countries and be as um, active as you are, what it's like, what would you say is the number one thing you can do just as an average American to try and help poverty or in some way um, do your small part? So, and this is, this is something that I have, has become and grown into a deep conviction. Um, I think that purpose is matured passion. So we all have like passion. I'm excited about fishing or I'm excited about growing a business or I'm excited about doing blah, 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 blah. But passion is good. Passion's awesome. Like love passion. Passion means you're willing to suffer for something that you love. Mm -hmm. 
the thing about passion is that it's not it's not as complete as purpose because what passion always has as the key ingredient is you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like, this is what I love. This is what I want. This is going to do like, we even ask kids like, what do you want to do? Where do you want to do? Um, purpose has at its core human flourishing and helping somebody else. And I really believe that every passion finds its completeness and purpose. So I think the single thing that every person can do to fight global poverty is find purpose in their passion. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, if you love fishing, great. Figure out how to fish and serve somebody else. Right. You know, you still get to do the fishing, but now you're bringing a friend who's discouraged and you're encouraging them or you're yeah. teaching a kid or you're like giving the fish away. <laughs> I don't know, you know, like whatever. There's something like this. this Letting passion mature into purpose is is a key is a key ingredient for um yeah. So like that global poverty. The other thing that I I really discover, like one of the reasons why Instruments of Joy I think is really successful is um one of the key challenges in poverty is people lose hope. Right. So if you grew up and, you know, like I was in an orphanage in Malawi and it's an AIDS orphanage and you've got about 60 kids who every one of their parents had died of AIDS. There's no electricity. They eat once a day. And there's you look around and it's like there's no hope. Yeah. But then this kid comes in with a gas can and a block of wood that he somehow fashioned into a ukulele like thing. And he started to sing. And his voice was beautiful and the song transcended the, the current circumstance. And now he saw hope. And so if you don't, if you live in an impoverished community, you really need to see beautiful things. And I don't think that there's enough art in, in poverty alleviation. We think about food and clothes and rice. and Yeah. Okay. Everybody needs that. That's great. You need security. You need all this stuff. But if you really see someone as as valuable as yourself, you care about their soul, not just their body. And I think relief and development agencies like can be defined by body servants, which is just crap. Like they're people and they're they're you. It's you. And yeah. so we don't only need our body served, we need our souls fed. And so I think beauty and art and inspiration and things like that is is a really valuable thing to bring into the world. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Um, I think a lot of people can relate to that. And if you aren't, uh, you know, like I said, going to go to these countries, what can you do? But there's also like not always value in like, if you're not good at something, you don't necessarily need to do to do it. So use what you're good at and use it to the best of your ability to serve others. And if that's music, then make music that will serve others yeah. or cooking, cook to serve cook. others. Yeah. I think that's a good yeah, that When a passion matures, it becomes a purpose. Yeah. So um, uh, you talked a little bit about just how you're ambitious and how this, uh, what is it, the strength model? What were you saying? Uh, strength finder, yeah, achiever. Yeah. Finder achiever model. So I am wondering, because um, I, I have things I want to do or convictions, how do you take what you want and actually um, bring it to action? Um, like, what would you say? Um, for people who have a dream or they want to start a business or anything in that realm, what's what's the rip of the band-aid? Like, how do you go from this idea to starting your business or meeting people who are going to help bring action into your plan? For me, for me personally, this was a faith journey. I mean, 100%. Um, so I was a litigation technology consultant. My income tripled. I wrote an article that was the cover of the Nashville Bar Journal. And I started getting stuck by success mm -hmm. because now I'm making more money and now I have responsibilities and I'm doing this and I'm doing this program and I've got kids and I got this house and I'm, I'm, you can get stuck on the corporate ladder. And so what I did for me was like, okay, if God is real, like, I know that I'm not going to live forever. Like, I, it doesn't take, like, one out of one people will die. Like, 
Everybody <laughs> dies. One out of one. And so it's like I was young and I was like successful and I was fundamentally unsatisfied because everywhere that I turned, I just saw greed and power hungry. And I realized if I stay on this ladder, I'm going to end up in greed and power hungryville. And I just don't, I just I don't want that. So I was like, okay, God, if you're real, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. You bring me three people to serve and I'll serve them. And so I quit my job. I, I put in a three month notice and I was like, if this doesn't work, then I can go and just like work at any of the law firms in town or do, you know, do whatever I want uh, or not do whatever. I, yeah. Well do whatever I want. But I just, I did, I gave, I did a whatever prayer, which is like not oh, whatever, but it's like, God, whatever you want, you're, you're, you're the, you made the universe. If you want me to do something, just tell me to do it. And that led me to like seven years in 21 countries studying global poverty on 50 trips and documentaries that raised millions of dollars and gave a hundred thousand people clean drinking water and like promo videos for compassion international and helping orphanages. Like I, I became a filmmaker, mm -hmm. uh, which was a passion that became a purpose. Right. But then ultimately that led to realizing the way that I'm wired, my best um, play in fighting global poverty is organizational development. Um, so I guess the answer to my question, the answer to the question is the golden handcuffs need to get burned and thrown away and just take a risk. And like, I, I, if you don't have like there's a book called halftime where people one of the most dissatisfying things in life is success mm -hmm. because you make all this money you reach these achievements and then you're like and what <laughs> is actually adds more stress than i thought it would and i don't I, I just feel more responsibility and i have all this stuff so i think uh success success doesn't actually satisfy uh, purpose satisfies, serving people satisfies. So I think the number one thing is take risks to serve. Um, it's, it's critical. We, and I've, and I've done that with like kids yeah. <laughs> and, and like the, this, um, I, I guess marry well so that <laughs> your spouse will go along with your crazy adventures. Uh, that's a really important one. And then take risks. That's an, that's another one. Okay. But just, you know, frankly, I guess the, the primary, the, the emphasis of with that is deal with God. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I'm like, I had to get personal <laughs> with God and just say, Hey, if you're real, prove it, show me what to do and I'll go do this. And if you're not, then I'm going to go live like hell and do whatever I want. So, <laughs> but get real with God and then take risks and marry well. There, there's my answer to that question. Marry well, take risks, get well with God. I'll write it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've talked, uh, you've mentioned a couple of books um, and like people that you look up to and I love to read. So I'm just curious, uh, like what's your number one book recommendation for growing like your human capital or your skills as a leader or et cetera? <laughs> Uh, I'm writing it. <laughs> so right. the growability book will be this. out. Uh, <laughs> and when it is, that will be the book that I, that I highly recommend. Okay. Um, you know, I'm actually, my I, ears peeled. I, what's that? I said, I'll keep my ears peeled. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think rather than a particular book, the rhythm of reading like so i'm an audible processor so i listen to books rather than read them i read very slow i'll read like four or five books a year but i'll listen to a book a week okay um so i think that i think that everybody should do a good mix of nonfiction and fiction mm -hmm. like find your mix these are some nonfiction books these are some fiction books but don't don't be exclusive on either one. Like make sure that you're listening from either one. But I think leadership is primarily about growth. So you should find books that will help you grow. Management is primarily about um, like progress and or not progress. It's more like profitability and stability. So finding books about how to stabilize and, you know, like self-help books and stuff like that. Uh, 
and then marketing is primarily about influence. So finding books that teach you how to be the best you. Maybe, maybe just read self help books. Never mind. Right. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I read, I read, I read books that help me grow, that help me stabilize, and that help me live on purpose. Mm -hmm. So rather than a particular one, like because stuff that I thought was cool when I was 20. Now I'm like, uh, I don't, I don't Now I read Drucker, you know, it's like, <laughs> there's like different, it, it's different, it's different things. But, uh, but what I would say as a fundamental tool is um, get a strength finder, uh, take the strength finder test and understand your primary strengths. Right. Uh, and if you have a chance to actually do uh, the grow ability training on that, uh, I would, it, it it's a game changer. So I'll be glad to help you, Lucy. <laughs> so you take the strength funder test and then I'll meet I'll with you share with you the uh how you can apply these strengths because we we are we all have areas where these are strengths. We have areas that are competencies and then we have areas that are like frustration zones that'll wear us out. And a a lot of times we get assigned to things that are either strengths or competencies or frustration zones. And we've got to avoid frustration zones or you need help in frustration zones. And we want to plug into our strength zones. So understanding what your strengths are and playing to those and making sure that you're up, you're assigned to an apt role to maximize your strength in an organization is critical. The strength finder test is used by 80% of Fortune 500 companies. And there's like 80 million people have taken the test. So it's like, a, it's not kind of like a come and go Right. Uh, personality thing. So I highly recommend that. Okay. I'll have to do it. I've, I've heard about it, never done it yet. <laughs> oh yeah. You're in for a treat. Sorry. My, my power went out on my, um, on my, I'm going to go in another room <laughs> so that, because it's getting dark in this room. The sun is setting earlier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the power is out in half of my office <laughs> and it's on in the other half of my office. So we'll, we'll come over here. Awesome. Okay. Uh, where was my next question? So, um, ooh, where did it go? So, um, as in our class, uh, we talk a lot about leadership, um, but it kind of is like relative to where you're you're at in life. And so, uh, for younger people, like I'm sure you've seen, like your experiences, your opportunities change as you get older. For younger people, though, who maybe aren't running businesses or leaders? How can they be leaders um, just within their community? And just in general, um, how can people develop their leadership skills when they're not in a leadership role? I mean, really, leaders are listeners and leaders are learners. You know, so like this is the number one thing, like traveling 50, 50 trips overseas. Like, don't don't try to go teach anything <laughs> just go and learn yeah <laughs> um it's like i don't need to teach i just need to listen especially yeah. if there's like old people just listen to them <laughs> listen to even people. if they're not like smart there's still like there's experience there's right. value in experience um so i um yeah i so i i i hunted down um old people that were in careers and lives that i was fascinated by and when you it, finding mentors who have been where you want to go and then actually doing what they say listening is to the that. most important thing so i've i've had mentors that you know, would li like charge people thousands of dollars an hour just to, they, that's what they charge to talk to people. But because I would just bug them all the time, they would give me time. And I would just, I would question the crap out of them. I would ask them about this and this and this. And so, and I, and I always was able to keep the ones that whenever they told me to do something, I did it. Right. I would lose any of the mentors that when they told me to do something and I was like, eh, I don't want to, I don't want to make a budget. I don't want to. And then like you call them and they're like, oh, they're not available anymore. So I think critical is finding mentors um, and doing what they say. The other two things we've kind of touched on, but travel and books are, are, are 
in my life, travel and books have been the primary education that allows me to make money. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, ed education has given me great opportunities to talk to people. Travel and books gives me the ability to make money. So mm -hmm. that's where I, I yeah, like if you graduate and then you're like, I'm done because I'm smart and I, right. I have a certificate. Yep. You're going to get, you're going to get lost to the people that continue to learn even when they're done with school. Just yeah. keep traveling, keep reading books, and then you'll always be marketable. Lifelong learner. Yeah. Yeah. Lifelong yeah. learner. Le lear leaders are learners. Leaders are listeners. Um, and marry somebody who will take risks. It's the other thing on the list. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, yeah. no, no, no. I was the risk taker. Sarah was a yes. stabilizer. So, uh, you know, marry Maybe somebody who doesn't think, like, don't marry people who are exactly like you. You'll, you'll be imbalanced. <laughs> Find somebody who's completely opposite than you and then figure out how to live together. That's 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 mostly marriage. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to get relationship advice as well. Always <laughs> well, I maybe should keep my <laughs> uh, no, hey, we've been married 25 years. We have nine kids. We're we're happy. So something I, is working. I, I'll, I'll give some marriage advice. Yeah. Yes, something is working. Um okay, well, we just have a few more minutes. So I'm just gonna ask um a very, very broad question. We've all we've talked about it before. It's just broad, but I always want to ask people like what is the number one piece of advice, just not even related to leadership or business, but just for life in general, like what is the takeaway that you would want to tell your younger self or someone that you want to help? Um, I mean, I, a big I'm, <laughs> I just, I just read a book called the ruthless elimination of hurry. Uh -huh. And I think that there's so much truth in like ours, like, so I've got a, a, a global perspective because I've been able to travel around the globe and um, there's some fallacies in American way of life. One of them is that faster and bigger is better. Um, that's just not true. Fa faster and bigger are not better. Right. Um, like, for example, the nonprofits when I was running my nonprofits, I was always focused on, well, what's how big should your nonprofit be? Well, as big as it can. No, your nonprofit should be just like a beautiful size for what it is. Yeah. And so like a meal, like if I want to say what, how, what's the ideal meal? Well, it's not as big as, as, as it can, or as fast as it can. Yeah. The ideal meal depends on what you want to do. If it's Italian, well, I want to cook this thing for a while and I want to sit down and I want to enjoy it. So I think um, fa fast food is not as good as slow food. Yeah. And um, and so I think that that's one thing is just like fast and big are not are should should not be primary life objectives. Um, the other thing is that it, with with is almost more important than what who are you doing with with right like you know if i do, if i'm doing and even like in relationship with god we want to do stuff for god or i did this thing but yeah life is actually better with god like if if the maker of the universe walks with you that's a bigger deal than just like walking by yourself right so with and slow down be with people see your career more as like a meal than like a accomplishment. Yeah. There you go. I, I, I gave you like six different yes, things. You, you, you heard it here though. <laughs> heard it here <laughs> first folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think that's some really good advice, uh, especially for uh, the younger generation. And um, this is global leadership. So learning that America obviously doesn't have all the answers or it's, it's you know, always good to have a global perspective and see uh, where we're flawed. Like, yeah, America, America has all the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely don't have all the answers, but we are ridiculously tool rich. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a huge fan of giving people tools. If 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 you're digging a hole with a spoon and I give you a shovel, then you're going to be you're going to be more effective. 
Americans might think, oh, well, you're just not doing good enough because you dug that hole. And then you look and you're like, you dug that hole with a spoon. You're like, you're smarter and more, more capable than anybody that we know. You dug that hole with a spoon. Watch what happens if you give that people a shovel. Yeah. Poverty in the developing world is more about tool provision than it is about like knowledge provision. Yeah. But there's a, there is a really important book um, that is called The Culture Map that talks about eight different cultural realities of, of like that are geographically specific, like hi hierarchical cultures versus e egalitarian and high context, low context. Uh, the culture map is a fundamental book. If you're going to actually do any work internationally, that's a big, that's a really top important read. So understanding culture, yeah. don't, don't try to help somebody if you don't understand their culture. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> all right well th those are all the questions i have for you today um thank you so much for your time i learned a lot and i have some book recommendations um and yes i really appreciate you and your wisdom um i need to make sure i stop this recording and